What is the highest percent chance to get a critical hit on a single attack that a character can have in D&D 5e without magic items? I'm not talking about things that guarantee a critical hit, like attacking a paralyzed or unconscious creature, or getting surprise on an enemy if you're an assassin rogue, right? I'm talking about more run-of-the-mill stuff that doesn't require any, this might not work, preconditions to be met. The answer is 27.1%. You wanna see how to try to get the most out of having that fantastic crit chance? Then keep watching. Welcome to D4. Hey everybody, so here at D4, each week I take a deep dive into one, usually, sometimes more, uh, character builds for my favorite role-playing games. I like to crunch numbers about them, theorycraft about them, uh, not so that I can tell you the right way or the best way to play a certain character, but to explore one potential way to build something in the hopes of creating a character that's both really powerful but also really fun to play. So if you enjoy creating characters for your favorite role-playing games, almost as much as you enjoy playing the actual game itself, or if you're just looking for tips or ideas on how to build something that you're thinking about playing, then welcome home. This is where you belong, and I'm so glad you're here. So thank you for watching. My name's Colby, and yes, I have a man bun, and I'm not taking it out. <laughs> just give me one, just one video with the man bun. That's all I ask. Okay, I've got a lot of things on my mind to share with today's build, so let's just jump right in. First, I have been thinking a lot about crit fishing lately. A long time ago, I did a crit fisher build, uh, check it out right up there, a character who was trying to, you know, fish for crits, get a really high crit chance, and then when they did get a critical hit, unload with some big damage. I think it worked really well, but one comment that I got a ton of on that video was essentially, real crit fishers use elven accuracy. And don't get me wrong, I get it. Elven accuracy, powerful feat. Anyone who's been watching this channel for any length of time knows how I feel about it. But yeah, especially if you're crit fishing, because getting to roll three d20s to hit when you have advantage instead of two is a really nice increase to our chance to get a critical hit, right? If you have advantage on your attacks, Elven accuracy brings your crit chance to just over 14%. If you are critting on a 19 or a 20, though, plus elven accuracy, that's how you get to that magic 27% number. The big problem with elven accuracy in a crit fisher build is that you only get that triple advantage or super advantage three rolls, right? If you're using charisma, wisdom, intelligence, or dexterity for your attack. I mean, I guess in that in and of itself isn't a problem, but what is a problem is that the easiest way to get advantage in game right now, which you have to have in order to benefit from elven accuracy in the first place, that, you know, that just kind of works all the time whenever you want it, is the barbarian's reckless attack. And you can only take advantage of reckless attack if you are using strength for your attacks. So just doesn't really play nice with elven accuracy. There are other ways to get advantage in the game, of course, plenty, but the vast majority of them rely on you doing something first and often have a chance of failing. The fairy fire spell, knocking your enemy prone, the old darkness devil sight thing. These are all great, but sometimes an enemy will make a save against them or they can be a nuisance on the battlefield or perhaps most damningly, they take a round to set up. When have you ever cared about setup rounds? My critics may ask. And you know what? Yeah, they have a right to ask because I'm kind of notorious for building characters who can do a boatload of damage if everything works just right and if you take a round to set it all up, etc. To be fair, not all of my Nova or Burst Damage builds work this way, but a lot of them do. And in those instances, I'll usually be critical of that fact. And while I have done plenty of builds that are meant to just do big damage right on round one, like uh, the Supernova Moon, to name one, but yeah, my friend uh, Kobold, Pack Tactics put out a video recently about the value of burst damage early in a fight. It's a great vid. Check it out here if you haven't seen it. And it's had me thinking a lot lately about how important early damage really is. That's not to say that there aren't times when going Nova later in a fight is a bad idea. Idea. Maybe you're a melee character and you can't get in range of the enemies on round one. Maybe you start a fight thinking it'll be a breeze and you didn't want to blow all of your resources, but the enemies are tougher than you thought and now it's time to put the smack down. Maybe you thought you killed the big bad, but then they take on their final form. I don't know. But regardless, yes, generally speaking, it's tactically sound if you're going to burst 
to burst right away if possible so you can hopefully take out an enemy or maybe two before they get a chance to go making the rest of the fight a lot easier for your entire party right so when i was thinking about how to build an elven accuracy crit fisher i decided that i was going to commit to building one that was going nova right on round one finally after putting out my best builds for every level video a couple of weeks ago, it's actually today as I'm recording this, um, but yeah, check that out here if you haven't seen it. I was really proud of that one. Anyways, since then, I've also been thinking a lot about the value of builds that just work. Sure, it can be fun to put something together that's like, hey, if all the cards fall into place in just the right way and the enemy fails their save and you get some setup time, then this build freaking rocks. But yeah, I'm kind of in the mood right now to just test the limits of what's possible, where I don't have to depend on anyone other than my own character or anyone's dice rolls for it to work like I want it to pretty much every time. With all of that in mind then, here is my goal for this build, and the rule I'm going to adhere to while building it. Goal, get to as high a crit chance as possible, that elven accuracy, crit on a 19 or 20, 27.1% magic number, as soon as reasonably possible, and have some fun ways to unload big damage when we do crit, which will be often. And then the rule is I have to be able to burst right on round one. No setup required, and no, if the enemy fails their save, or if you have surprise shenanigans. It just straight up works, and it works immediately. Are you with me? Okay, awesome. Then let's dig in to D&D build number 170, the Crit Fisher 2.0. Huge thanks to my good friend Randall Hampton for the fantastic artwork that he put together for this build. I love what he does. If you're interested in following him on social media to check out the other stuff he's done or to potentially reach out to see if you could commission him to do some art for your character or even your entire party, I'll put links in the video description as always on how to do so. Okay, got my character, uh, the version of them when they change shape uh, the version of them when they get the enlarged spell cast on them. Uh, my journal for notes, backstory, rules book of course, can't forget that. Ooh, the map that I've been meticulously hand crafting and taking notes on. Oh, most importantly, my dice. Colby, you do realize that there are four other people that need to share this table with you, right? Who are you and what are you doing in my living room? I'm your DM, dude. We've been playing together for like seven years. Oh yeah. Anyways, you know why I have all these accoutrements, dude. I gotta keep track of everything. So many rules and events and names and details. I don't wanna forget anything that is happening or that has happened or that is going to happen. Any little detail of it because it's going to ruin the immersion of this world and this campaign that we have been so painstakingly crafting together. Right, but you could keep track of all of this in one place, you know. World Anvil? I tell you about it like every game night. World Anvil? World Anvil. Tell me again. <sighs> Just like I thought. Okay, World Anvil is like a one-stop shop for everything you need to keep track of in a campaign. I've got our world map uploaded there, along with what happened in every location you've been to so far and when, but I've been color coding this and everything. Sticky notes, I don't need it. All right. I've got like a wiki on the entire world in there. All the political factions, all the important characters, the important dates, locales. And I mean, you can put your character sheet in there as well as your backstory, session notes, everything. So I don't need this or this. Nope, just my tablet and my dice. Yep. Wow. I feel like I just went through like a cleansing session with Marie Kondo or something. So much joy, right? And the best part is World Anvil works with basically every TTRPG system out there. So when we play our once a month Star Wars campaign, you can still just get everything you need in World Anvil. So why haven't you told me about this yet? For reals. <laughs> Fine. How do I sign up again? I mean, you can get a free account by going to the URL in the video description or the pinned comment, but if you want to unlock everything with a paid subscription, just use the code D4 at checkout and you'll save 51%. That's gobbledygook. Seriously, 51%. Hogwash. Nope. Over half. Flim flam. For reals. Okay, well, I don't want to lose money on this or anything. Signing up now. Hella freaking Thanks, World Anvil, for making my life so much easier. 
and for sponsoring the video. Okay, let's get back to the build. All right, at level one for our starting class, here's the thing. <laughs> How often do I say that after saying, here's our starting class? Uh, I want rogue levels later for this build, much later actually, but for me, rogue is one of those classes where if you're gonna take some at some point, unless there's a good reason for starting with something else, I really like to start with rogue, since starting at rogue one gives you most of what you need to be a pretty effective scout and lock picker for your party if you want or need to fill that role. You get more proficiencies starting as rogue, thieves tools, proficiency, expertise, you're a pretty decent skill monkey even if you don't put any more levels here for a while. So yeah, assuming that you want to go that route as much as I do, let's start here, meaning that when we first meet our champion, they are something of a scoundrel. But I envision this character as being a very driven scoundrel. They are disciplined and rigorous in their training in the arts of subterfuge, demanding perfection of themselves and maybe even those they run with. They might even be like a Thieves Guild or Assassin's Guild leader, I think. As for our race, well, I've already said that we want Elven Accuracy, so that means we're going either Half Elf or Full Elf, right? Or, you know, maybe an Eladrin or a Shadar Kai, those count as Elves too. And I tend to always be a little more prone to Half Elf myself, since they get better starting ability scores, but I wouldn't consider it mandatory necessarily. I'm gonna assume we're going half elf. As for which sub race of half elf to choose, just pick your favorite. I tend to prefer drow half elf for the spells or wood half elf for more move speed, but nothing's gonna be super imperative to the build. For our ability scores, I'm assuming point by as always and say, let's go with a 15 dexterity, take a plus two there, a 13 constitution plus one, a 13 charisma plus one, and then a 13 strength. Yeah, we're gonna be pretty mad, multiple ability score dependent, but thanks to half elf, we do have an easier time dealing with that. Oh, and by the way, you could get that strength to a 14 if you really wanted. We need it at least a 13 for multi-classing, but I think I'd just as soon put my wisdom at a 10 personally. So anyways, do what you want there. As for our equipment, uh, starting off, I'm going to say let's go gold by, grab some studded leather, a rapier, and a shield, though we're not proficient in shields just yet. As a rogue one, rogue one, then we get Thieves Cant, which is the special coded language that thieves can use to send messages to one another uh, in a kind of hidden way, right? Then we get Expertise, which lets us double our proficiency bonus with uh, either two skills that we're proficient in or one skill and then Thieves Tools, right? I'm gonna say let's go stealth or thieves tools, but if you aren't really planning on filling the sneaky, scouty role for your party, feel free to go perception instead or something else. In fact, I might actually take perception over one of those other two anyways, since our wisdom score is going to be so low and you need perception not just to, you know, <laughs> perceive things, but it also helps to detect traps and find hidden doors, right? So worth considering. As a rogue one, one. We also get sneak attack, which tells us that once per turn, if we have advantage on the attack or are attacking someone standing next to our ally, we can add a d6 of damage to a hit so long as we're using either a ranged or finesse weapon. And yes, damage from sneak attack doubles on a crit. Nice. Before moving on, let me just give a quick shout out and thank you to my channel members. You guys are so awesome. I could not do this without you. I really appreciate your support. And if you're not a channel member, I'd appreciate it if you'd consider joining. There's a little button down there. It says join. Click it and it'll tell you the benefits that you can get by being a member. It's not very expensive. You can get access to the library of write-ups that I create for each of these builds to help you recreate it yourself a little more easily. Access to the D4 Discord server filled with wonderful, lovely people, and even access to our monthly live Q&A hangout sessions. If you want to consider it, awesome. If you don't, that's okay too. I appreciate you just being here, liking, subscribing, especially clicking the notifications bell, commenting. These are all great ways to support the channel too. So thank you for that too. Okay, at level two, with our roguish foundation secured, uh, I want to start multiclassing. And there's going to be a lot of that going on with this build. For me, I think my character or someone they care for here maybe has been slighted or affronted or wounded or maybe even killed. But the one who has wronged us is a lot more powerful than we are at the moment. For whatever reason, they're a little bit untouchable right now. So we decide to dedicate ourselves to the cause of vengeance, swearing an oath to get even eventually, doubling down on our discipline and devotion to becoming the most deadly, maybe anti-hero we can possibly become. Whatever your reasons, we are taking, yes, paladin levels now. Wait, a dex-based pally? That's right. And it's not even my first, actually. So, 
As a Pally 1, we get a couple of features. The best one is Lay on Hands, which gives us five Lay on Hands points per Paladin level that we can use with an action and a touch to either heal one hit point per point spent or cure a disease or poison for the cost of five points. Super efficient, super useful, scales nicely. Uh, they reset on a long rest. Divine Sense, the other feature we get here is a little bit less impressive, I think. It just lets us detect the presence of undead fiends or celestials within 60 feet of us, not behind total cover. Once in a while, you'll be glad you have it. At level three, we would be a paladin two, and that means we get a fighting style, and we are going with dueling here. It says that when we make an attack with a one-handed weapon and have no weapon in our other hand, we can do an extra two damage. Alas, that does not double on a crit, but we'll take it. And I like the idea of a light armor wearing rapier and shield using paladin here, which yeah, I didn't mention that, I guess. We get shield proficiency when we take paladin levels, right? And it's a bit of a unique take on the class, and I'm here for it. The thing that I'm mostly here for, though, is, of course, Divine Smite, which says that when we hit an enemy with a melee attack, we can spend a spell slot to do 2d8 additional radiant damage, plus 1d8 more for every spell slot above first that we spend, capping at 5d8 or 4th level spell slots. This is the real thing that we will be using to blow up our enemies on a crit, and it's gonna be spectacular, eventually. We also get spells at Paladin 2 here, and because we are going to be so focused on burst damage, this character's sustain damage isn't going to be quite as amazing, right? So if it were me, I'd probably focus on taking spells here that will bring some nice utility or support. Bless is for sure a go-to here, adding a d4 to the attack rolls and saving throws of multiple party members, so good. And then, sure, cure wounds for a backup heal option if you're out of lay on hands points, right? At level 4, we would be a Paladin 3, and that means we get Divine Health, which makes us immune to all disease, super handy if it ever comes up in game, otherwise won't be that useful, but that's okay. Because we also at Pally 3 get our Sacred Oath, our Paladin subclass, and we are going, in case you couldn't tell with my little backstory, with Oath of Vengeance. This is such a great subclass, one of my favorites, especially for burst damage purposes. As a Vengeance Pally, we get a couple of new spells here, uh, Bane and Hunter's Mark, neither of which we'll plan on using during our Nova round, but might be worth using sometimes outside of that, so I won't complain about them. Then all Paladins get Channel Divinity here, which just like for Clerics, we we can use once per short rest. Now, every paladin can use it for harness divine power, letting us recover a spent spell slot once per day as a bonus action, the spell level of which is equal to half our proficiency bonus rounded up. But then, as a vengeance pally, we can use it for one of two additional things. Abjure enemy lets us attempt to frighten an enemy for one minute if they fail their wisdom save against it, and if they do, they're not only frightened but also can't move, though both of those effects end if they take damage. Uh, even if they succeed, though, their speed is still halved, so at least you get something in that case. The real gem here, of course, is Vow of Enmity, which lets us, with a bonus action, have advantage on attacks against a single enemy for one minute or until they're dead or unconscious. I really love this ability on this character since, again, it just gives us advantage right on round one if we want it, no questions asked, and that is what we're building for. At level five, we would be a Paladin four. That means we get our first ability score, increase or feat. And yes, of course, we we are going to take Elven Accuracy, probably my favorite feat in all of 5e. This raises our dexterity for us by one to a nice even 18, and then tells us that if we make an attack with dexterity or wisdom or intelligence or charisma and have advantage, then we can roll three d20s to try and hit instead of two, putting us at a lovely 14.26% chance to crit now, when we have advantage anyways, and that is fantastic. At level six, we would be a Paladin five, and that means we get extra attack so that we can attack twice when we take the attack action on our turn, leading to more chances to crit and smite our foes right out of the gate. And we also get second level spells here, and sticking with the like support and utility theme, let's grab aid to buff maximum hit points and heal also. A lesser restoration for a little cure all, and then, I mean, yeah, we're a paladin, we kind of have to take fine steed, right? Of course we don't really have to, but it would be silly not to, I think. It lets us summon a warhorse, or something else less mechanically good if you really want, and that warhorse will just stay with us forever until it gets reduced to zero hit points, or we dismiss it. Now, the question I always ask with this spell is, should we count it towards the damage calculations? And the answer is usually 
sure, I know the rules for mounted combat in 5e are super wonky, but the vast majority of tables, so far as I can tell, let you both decide where the steed goes and let it make attacks against you when you want to attack, regardless of the whole, are they an independent or mount or are they controlled mount shenanigans, right? The spell description says you can communicate telepathically and that you fight as a seamless unit. That's good enough for me, and apparently most of you as well. If you don't want to count the steed's damage, that's fine. It's not a huge amount. It'll be like 10-ish points of damage depending on the enemy armor class. They're not going to have advantage, they're not smiting, it's just a little bump. Speaking of though, at level 6 it is time for our first damage report. So what does combat look like for us right now? It's fairly simple. We charge into battle on our trusty steed, put Vow of Enmity on our target, and smite them twice with a couple of rapier attacks, using both of our second level spell slots, potentially, for 3d8 each, applying the extra d6 from sneak attack on our first hit. Now, if you are truly crit fishing, you might want to just hold off on smite and sneak attack until you crit, right? Our chance to crit on a single hit is 14%, like I've said, but our chance on landing at least one critical hit on our turn, since we're making two attacks, is over 26%. Not bad. Of course, we've only got guaranteed advantage on a single enemy per short rest, right, with Vow of Enmity. You don't get to transfer it or anything once your target's dead, so you might just want to smite away right from the get-go regardless, in the hopes of taking out at least one enemy on round one. As for our steed, here's something nice. Thanks to the Warhorse's trampling charge feature, if they move in a straight line for at least 20 feet and then hit with a hooves attack, the enemy has to make a DC 14 strength save or be knocked prone. If they are prone, the Warhorse gets to make a second attack against them. Freeze of number crunching, I'm just going to assume that there's a 50% chance that the enemy is prone on this first round, thanks to our Warhorse's trampling charge. I think it's pretty safe to assume that we'll be able to charge in on round one, right? Combat starts, we're going to be at least 20 feet away from our enemies most of the time. If not, we could probably back up and then charge. But also, if the enemy is prone thanks to trampling charge, then we'll have advantage on attacks against them, meaning that we should wait to see if we knock them prone before we use Vow of Enmity, uh, letting you save it for a second enemy or maybe a second combat encounter if you have one before your next short rest, right? Thanks, horsey. Okay, so under those assumptions, against an enemy with a 10 armor class, we would on average here do 74 total damage on average during our Nova round, round one, and against an enemy with a 15 armor class, it would be 68 damage. And compared to other Nova damage builds that I've done to date at this level, that's pretty great. Call it bottom half of tier one. All right, Crypt Fisher. Now, as far as how well this compares to my original Crypt Fisher build, it's a little tough to say because that build was actually made for sustained damage, right? And so it's not really a very good apples to apples comparison. <laughs> I mean, it was really more like a, here's the damage you would do on average, but save your smites for when you get a crit kind of thing. So it was sort of a burst damage build, but not a burst on demand build. And so the easiest way to calculate it seemed to be just assume you only smoked when you got a crit. I know it's a little bit wonky, just like this is a little bit wonky to call it a crit fisher, but then crunch numbers like you're smiting regardless of whether you crit or not. Anyways, that build was averaging DPR that put them into tier two, so they were solid, but they didn't have smite by level six this level, so they weren't even capable of much demand burst on demand burst damage anyways. I'll report back on how we compare in the final thoughts at the end. All right, with extra attack secured, along with smite and several spell slots to go along with it, I think it's time to turn our attention towards getting an even better crit chance. For this build, my favorite way to do that is via some fighter levels. Yeah, yeah, I'll talk about Hexblades a little later. But we get a lot out of a few fighter levels. Wait, we're leaving Paladin behind? Aura of Protection is right there, dude. I know, I know. You go ahead and take Pally 6 first. Aura of Protection is awesome. To be fair, it's not quite as awesome for us since we only have a 14 charisma, but it's still nice. I am beholden to the spreadsheet and only really have my eye on damage, which is why I'm doing this, but feel free to be more well-rounded if you're playing this character in game. Anyways, at Fighter 1, we get a fighting style. We, we get another fighting style. And since we've already got Duelist and aren't actually planning on like dual wielding or using a heavy weapon on this build, I'm gonna say let's just grab superior technique, which lets us learn one maneuver from the Battlemaster maneuver list, and also gives us one superiority die per short rest to fuel that maneuver with, though it's only a d6 as opposed to the normal d8. This can potentially add to our critical hits, and that's the main reason I want it anyways, and I'd probably grab either trip attack or menacing attack, as both let us add a d6 to our attack when we hit, potentially knocking the enemy prone or frightening them, depending on 
on which one you take. And yeah, I'd probably try and save this for when I crit, personally, unless you really need it otherwise. At level 8, we would be a fighter too, and yeah, if we're building for burst damage, it's hard to leave out action surge, right? Which would let us now take two actions once per short rest, nearly doubling our damage potential on our burst round now. At level 9, I mean, since we were going to get action surge anyways, we might as well go just one more level of fighter so that we can get our martial archetype, right? Our subclass, because that would let us pick up the champion archetype, that most vanilla of all subclasses, because champions get the improved critical feature, which says that we crit on a 19 or a 20, and thus we have finally arrived at that vaunted 27% chance to crit on a single attack when we have advantage. Okay, at level nine, it is time for our next damage report. Since last check, we have seen a pretty massive bump to our Nova round thanks to doubling our number of attacks and nearly doubling our crit chance. We've also added a little d6 of damage, potentially 2d6 on a crit, right, thanks to superior technique. Quite notably, with advantage, elven accuracy, improved critical, and four attacks during our Nova round, there is about a 72% chance that at least one of our attacks will crit during our Nova round. So yeah, more often than not, on that opening round, we're gonna crit at least once. So even if we're smiting on every attack, regardless, with a second level smite for two of them and a first level smite for the other two, I'd almost surely be waiting to use sneak attack and my superiority die until I rolled that 19 or 20, right? There's a really high likelihood that you're gonna get at least one. Anyways, if we went all out right on round one against an enemy with a 10 AC, we would on average do now 132 damage during our Nova round, and against a 16 AC, it would be just slightly less, 124 damage, which is about double since last check, not surprisingly, but very gratifyingly. And compared to other Nova builds I've done to date at this level, that's kind of bottom half of tier one still, really great place to be, and sure, you might not want to blow all of your resources in a single round of combat like this, it might be overkill, but if you just wait to crit and then unload everything that you can when you do, you're gonna do 56 damage on average with just that one hit. That's awesome. Pile on three more attacks and you are very likely to take out most enemies that you'd be fighting at this level in a single round, even if you don't blow all of your resources. All right, at level 10, now that we've gotten most of what we need out of Fighter and Paladin, and our crit chance as high as it can be, the best thing we can do for our burst damage here is to increase our spell slots to get us bigger smites, and since we're already a charisma-based caster, that's going to mean going Bard, which could be great, Warlock, which has some pros and cons, or what I'm going to take, Sorcerer. Now, let's break that decision down a little bit. If you're playing up to or beyond level 15, definitely consider Warlock. I, of course, strongly considered going Hexblade when putting this build together. Some of you have probably been scratching your head wondering why I didn't this entire time. Hexblade would give us a lot of things we want. Crit on a 19, Eldritch Smite. The big problem was I couldn't get to Eldritch Smite and have advantage by level six without a setup round. Sure, I could have gone Darkness Devil Sight, right? But that takes around a setup, not to mention that it can be really obnoxious for everybody else at your table. And while going, say, Vengeance Pally or Assassin Rogue combined with Hexblade could have gotten me advantage without a setup round, I wanted to be able to crit fish with Elven Accuracy right for our first damage report and have extra attack, which kind of necessitated Vengeance Pally. Plus, I've already hit my limit of Hexblade dips this quarter with a Hexbow, and I kind of already did that Hexblade crit fisher build anyways, uh, right up here, the Locket and Bard, right? Besides, Going Sorcerer will actually give us more potential total burst damage over an entire round, uh, even later on in the game, for two reasons. Better spell slots, since multiclassing with Sorcerer and Paladin combines levels from both to give us more total spell slot levels, right? Uh, sure, it's slower multiclassing with a half-caster like Paladin, but Warlock spell slots don't mix with other caster classes. But also, because Sorcerer will get us to Quickened Spell, as we will get into eventually. But if you're truly just saving those resources for when you crit, and not just like blowing a smite on every single attack that you make on round one and hoping that at least one of them becomes a crit, then Warlock might be a little better thanks to Eldritch Smite, which you can apply to the same attack as Divine Smite if you have both, right? In that scenario, I mean, as a sorcerer, if we wait to crit and then smite with a fourth level spell slot and add sneak attack, I'm talking about like character level 15 here, we would crit for 75 damage 
damage. So as a Warlock, if you wait to crit and then hit them with both a Divine Smite and an Eldritch Smite at the same time, your Warlock spell slots are only going to be third level at that point if we follow the build up till this point the same way anyways. But both together would be 8d8 damage, right? Or 16d8 on a crit. Add sneak attack and you're doing 102 damage on average on a single critical hit. But, right, we're not building for a single hit necessarily, we're building for total burst damage potential, even though when you play this character in game you very well may be saving your smites for crits most of the time. Capiche? Okay, so why has your disciplined leader of an assassin's guild who has sworn an oath of vengeance suddenly started taking sorcerer levels here? I'm not sure. Perhaps the strain of their rigorous discipline became too much for them at some point. Something broke inside of them and unleashed forces of chaos that had been lying dormant inside, but that they had been like bottling up. Maybe they actually exacted their vengeance, fulfilled their oath, and in a moment of exultant fervor manifested some strange new wild powers? Because at level one, sorcerers get their subclass, their sorceress origin, and I would like to take wild magic. I think. Feels like a bit of an opposing force to the character that we've been building, no? I think seeing the pendulum swing far to the other side for this character could be really cool though, and I bet you could come up with a great story reason for why it happened. Wild magic definitely is not necessary for the build to work or anything, they get a couple of features here. The first, wild magic surge, is what they're famous for. It says that when you cast a sorcerer spell of first level or higher, the DM can have you roll a d20, and if you roll a 1, then you roll a 100 sided die and see what kind of surge happens happens based on the wild magic surge table, which can result in some pretty silly or awesome or painful stuff happening. As usual though, when I take wild magic, the thing I'm mostly interested in here is the tides of chaos feature that they get, which says that once per long rest, you can just give yourself advantage on an attack roll, save, or ability check. And this might be really nice to have for those of us with Elven Accuracy who are fighting a big fight, but we've already used up our Vow of Enmity and could really use a crit right about now kind of thing, right? Also, we're told that the DM can just have you roll on the Wild Magic Surge table any time you cast a first level sorcerer spell or higher, and afterwards, you regain the use of your advantage. So, hey, if you and your DM are up for some potential insanity, you might be able to have another source of advantage somewhat regularly. As for the sorcerer spells that we get at Sorcerer 1 here, I mean, of course we should grab shield and silvery barbs, speaking of finding more ways to give yourself advantage, right? But I'm especially interested in Booming Blade and or Green Flame Blade. Both of them do extra damage on a hit and then more damage, either if the one you hit moves before your next turn in the case of Booming Blade or damage to an adjacent enemy in the case of Green Flame Blade, right? Now, we're not going to be using these yet, in fact, not till the end of the build, since casting these cantrips would take our entire action and it's not going to be as good as just taking the attack action. But yeah, like I say, we will make use of them later. At level 11, we would be a sorcerer too, and that means we get Font of Magic. These are just our sorcery points, right? We get one per sorcerer level, and we can use them right now just to create more spell slots for ourselves, which is great. Later, we might want to also sacrifice spell slots to get more sorcery points, uh, once we can use those for meta magic, which we would pick up next level, level 12, we'd be a sorcerer 3. Uh, we get to learn two meta magic options, and I'm going to go for my favorite, of course, quicken spell, which lets us cast a spell with a casting time of an action as a bonus action instead. Very nice. And as for the second one to take, go ahead and pick your favorite. Uh, maybe grabbing twin spell or subtle spell, or whatever your preference might be. Unfortunately, I'm not planning on making use of quicken spell yet because we need our bonus action still on round one for Vow of Enmity, right? If you are somehow able able to get your vow going before combat begins, or don't mind waiting until round two to go nova, sure. Quickening a booming blade on your nova round, or green flame blade, is a really nice way to add a little more nova damage. At the moment, uh, both of those cantrips hit for an extra 2d8 damage on a hit. Those would double on a crit, right? And there's no reason you couldn't also add a smite to that hit as well, or even sneak attack if you crit, right? I'm not going to assume that we're doing this yet, though. Like I said, I don't want any contingencies for this burst damage to just work right on round one. We get second level sorcerer spells here though too, and yeah, there are lots of great options here, of course. Misty Step, Mind Spike, Invisibility, Spider Climb, Vortex Warp, 
web. But the only one I'm gonna mention for consideration on our Nova round is my darling baby, Shadowblade. It's great in that it conjures a simple finesse weapon in your hand that does a ton of damage per hit. 2d8 as a second level spell, more if you upcast it. But yeah, the problem with it for this build is that it not only requires concentration, but also costs a bonus action to cast. Like I've said, we still need our bonus action for Vow of Enmity, unless of course, we're fighting in dim light or darkness. Because remember, with Shadowblade, you have advantage on all of your attacks if you're standing in dim light or darkness. In that case, absolutely. Summon the blade on round one with your bonus action, then make your attacks, enjoying some extra damage from the blade, assuming you don't have an amazing magic rape here by now, which of course you might, and not needing Vow of Enmity. I'm not going to assume that we're doing this, of course. Like I've been saying, no contingencies, no setup rounds, but this will be really nice to have for those times that you're fighting in a dimly lit area. Right? Or again, maybe if you can somehow get the spell off like before combat begins. Don't forget that thanks to how multiclassing with spellcasters works, we do have third level spell slots now if we wanted to upcast a shadow blade for 3d8 damage per hit, or if we wanted to use those spell slots for 4d8 smites. At level 13, we would be a sorcerer of four, meaning we get an ability score increase or feat, and that would let us get our dexterity to 20 and cap it finally, which will be a nice increase to both our hit chance and our armor class and our damage on a hit and all of our roguish skills and utility. Okay, at level 13, it is time for our next damage report. Since last check, we have capped our dexterity, picked up more and higher spell slots for smiting, plus picked up some nice utility potential and general versatility that comes from sorcerer levels and spells. Our tactics though haven't really changed much and so Against an enemy with a 10 armor class here, we would on average do 167 damage. And against a 17 armor class, it would be 159 during our Nova round. Only a few points lower, right? I just, ugh. This is why I love Elven Accuracy so much. It almost makes the enemy AC irrelevant, or practically so. But compared to other Nova builds that I've done to date, uh, this puts us more like in the middle of tier two by comparison. We've plateaued a bit since last time. We're still in a great place. We just wanna do more than simply increase our smite damage if we want to see bigger gains, which we will try and do here shortly. At level 14, it finally makes sense from the spreadsheets perspective anyways, to just go ahead and grab Paladin 6 now. We've capped our dexterity with sorcerer levels and taking one level of Paladin does just as much for our spell slots as taking another level of sorcerer would. Remember, when multi-classing half casters with full casters, we take the number of half caster levels, cut them in half, round down, and then add that number to the full caster levels when trying to figure out how many spell slots we have, right? So Paladin 5 was only getting us two levels of full caster, essentially, for spell slot purposes. Going to Pali 6 gets us three levels of full caster. Follow me? And yeah, that also means we get the arguably overpowered Aura of Protection, which increases our saving throws by our Charisma modifier and does the same for all of our allies within 10 feet. Very nice, uh, but would be nicer if we had a higher Charisma. Must resist Hexblade. Anyways, yes, uh, this means then that we have fourth level spell slots now, so we can, if we want, smite for the cap of 5d8 on a hit, right? Or 10d8 on a crit. At level 15, since we only have one fourth level spell slot, I figured let's take one more sorcerer level, making us a sorcerer five so that we can have two of them at least. Plus, sure, I mean, that means we get third level sorcerer spells. And I mean, yeah, I'd love to have Spirit Shroud or Haste and add those to the damage report, not to mention Counterspell and Fear and Hypnotic Pattern and Fly and all the other great third level spells, right? The problem with, you know, things like Spirit Shroud or Haste is that they require a setup. So no, I'm just gonna say, pick your favorite here. And yeah, if you can get one of those off before combat starts, go for it. Uh, I still think Shadow Blade's gonna be a little bit better depending on what magic weapon you'd be replacing Shadow Blade with if you had one. But yeah, I don't wanna have to sacrifice my bonus action or action on round one to cast any of these spells if I'm trying to prioritize Nova damage right from the get go. Kind of crazy, right? I'm not assuming that we're concentrating on anything. This whole freaking build it feels almost sacrilegious. But hey, it is nice knowing that we can do big burst right away without needing to make any assumptions, I think. At level 16, with a couple of fourth level spell slots under our belt for smiting now, finally, I think I'd actually want to end the build with some more rogue levels to give ourselves 
two more damage bumps. A fairly big one and a fairly small one. So yeah, we're ending where we started. We've come full circle here. So this means we'd be a rogue two here and that gives us cunning action. This lets us dash, disengage, or hide as a bonus action instead of an action. That's kind of nice. But then finally for us at level 17, we would be a rogue three and I really wanted to get to this level in rogue. I wish I could have gotten here sooner because it gives us our rogue subclass, our roguish archetype. And what do you think I'm going with? I mean, sure, Arcane Trickster would be nice to help out our spell slot progression. This would mean a fifth level spell slot, among other things. But I want to go Assassin. Why? Primarily because of the Assassinate feature, which tells us, sure, that if we hit an enemy that's surprised, then the attack is an automatic crit. But that's just gravy here, as far as I'm concerned for this build. Again, I want this character to be something that just works right on round one without any kind of contingencies or setup or anything. So, sure, if you can surprise your enemy, congratulations. But no, what I'm most interested in here is the fact that also with Assassinate, you have advantage on attacks against anyone who hasn't gone in combat yet. Wait a sec you might be saying. We already have advantage thanks to Vow of Enmity. Isn't this redundant? Uh, kinda, sure, but not really, because while it is nice to just get advantage on demand, Vow of Enmity takes a bonus action, and I was okay relying on that while I was building up everything else because we got so much out of all the other classes that we took first. I tried crunching the numbers and working this in sooner, and it just didn't make sense mathematically anyways to sacrifice bigger smites from Sorcerer. But now that we've gotten pretty much everything that we need from those other classes, going back to Rogue here will essentially let us free up that bonus action during our Nova round, meaning we could use it to, you guessed it, Quicken Booming Blade or Green Flame Blade with our bonus action on round one instead of using Vow of Enmity, which, now that we're level 17, by the way, are going to hit for an extra 3d8 damage. Very nice. We also get Steady Aim, which says that we can use our bonus action to give ourselves advantage on our next attack this turn, but only the next attack, right? Not every attack. And we have to sacrifice our movement to do it. Again, sure, maybe outside of round one, if you just really need advantage on an attack and you've used up your Tides of Chaos ability, right? You could use this then maybe just booming blade with your action even, hoping for a big huge critical, right? The small damage bump I mentioned comes from the fact that sneak attack goes up to 2d6 here uh, with three levels of rogue, right? And that will be 4d6 on a crit. And so, for our final damage report. Since last check, we've not only capped our potential damage from Divine Smite and increased our sneak attack a bit, but we've also added a fifth attack on our Nova round thanks to a Quickened Booming Blade or Green Flame Blade attack, as well as picked up some nice defensive and utility options along the way. Oh, and by the way, with five attacks in a round, now that we're Quickening a Booming Blade, right, our chance of getting at least one critical hit during our Nova round has gone up to almost 80%. So awesome. And so, against an enemy with a 10 armor class here, on average, we would do 200 147 damage. And against an AC 18, it would be 236. And that's a nice bump, putting us kind of top of tier two compared to other burst damage builds that I've done to date at this level, which is again, fabulous. So let's break it down here with some final thoughts. The tier score for this build, if you take the damage that they did at every armor class we calculated for at each of the four damage reports and just averaged it all into one big number, we end up with a 139, putting them in the upper half of tier two, not surprisingly. So, okay, couple of big questions to address here. First of all, how does this build compare to the first Crit Fisher build I did numbers wise? Again, we're not really comparing apples to apples because that build was looking at sustained damage and this one's burst, right? But I think the reality of any Crit Fisher build is that you're not really building for sustained damage, right? The idea is to get a critical hit and when you do, pile on every kind of additional damage thing you can pile on for a big Nova kaboom. With that first build though, I kind of went, hey, when you crit, you're gonna hit super hard, but you don't really know when that's going to happen, so we'll call it a sustained damage build. And I guess the problem with that approach on a crit fisher build is that a lot of the time you're gonna crit on an enemy when they're already super low. And so if you really do like smite and things every time you crit, a lot of times that damage is just gonna be overkill. Burst damage is just so much more effective when you can do it on demand and especially when you can do it right on round one. At least that way, your likelihood of getting overkill damage is a lot less. Unless your ally beat you in initiative and already got a target whittled down for you before your turn, but in that case, hopefully you can move on to a second target before your turn's over and either take them out too or 
just about kill him, right? Anyways, if we compare the burst damage capability of that first Critfisher build, assuming that they were just going to blow all of their resources early on in an, in an attempt to eliminate a target or two, and not just only smiting on a crit, etc., they were doing 60 to 90 points of damage less at level 17, depending on the enemy armor class, if they just tried to go Nova on round one, right? They had advantage basically all of the time, thanks to Reckless Attack, and some decent survivability, thanks to Rage, better sustained damage, thanks to Great Weapon Master, so yeah, a very different build, still pretty solid in its own right. It clocked in as a tier two sustained damage build, like I said, but again, I think if you're really building a crit fisher, you're better off getting that crit rate even higher with elven accuracy and being able to burst on demand right on round one. And in that light, I think 2.0 is a much better build. The other thing that just has to be said here is, you know, I'm comparing this to all the other Nova builds that I've done to date. The majority of those, if I'm not mistaken, either have some sort of contingency or have a setup round, or sometimes both. So we're not really comparing apples to apples here either when I compare these to other Nova builds. If I allowed myself a setup round, which I was going to do originally, and maybe we do cast Shadow Blade, right? Or Haste, or Spirit Shroud, and then go Nova on round two, our damage is gonna be way higher. It would have put this comfortably into tier one. So yeah, I don't know. Maybe I should have like reported the numbers where they could potentially be in a best case scenario, but then just sort of told you what they would be if you just wanted to try and burst on round one and let you decide, right? I mean, Really, you can probably figure it out for the most part and still make a very educated decision. Do you want to take a round and try and get a concentration spell going first? If so, yeah, round two is going to be that much better. But you might have let an enemy survive for an entire round who otherwise might have been dead. And was that really worth it? Hmm, maybe not. But you know what I think my favorite thing about this build is? It's just so atypical. I mean, we're a dexterity-based paladin wearing light armor. We're a Nova damage build who uses a shield and a rapier for their entire career. Looking over my spreadsheets, I think this is the highest Nova damage dealer I've ever built that uses a shield. So yeah, especially once we can get to Aura of Protection and if we move things around a bit to favor Charisma a little more, this character would have some fantastic survivability as well as utility and support capabilities, right? And like I've said, I've never planned on using a concentration spell though we had a lot of great ones available to us. I love the idea of going Nova on round one to get the odds of the fight going in our favor. And then sure, on round two, uh, throw up Spirit Shroud to bolster your sustained damage or bless for support or whatever else your party needs most. We can burst, we can support, we got great defense, some decent utility, even solid control options eventually, and might have been filling the role of the party's rogue for our entire career to boot. I love the unique flavor here combined with the like do-it-all aspect of the build too. In the end, I think it would be an absolute blast to play. It would bring so much versatility to the table. So I certainly hope that you get to try it out sometime for yourself, but whether you do or not, that's the build for the week. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you know how much I love you. You guys are so awesome. Thank you for all that you do for me, for the channel. Thanks for not laughing too hard at my man bun this week. I hope you have a fantastic day and a really great week. And if you don't, please hang in there. You can do this. I hope that you do good and be kind and stay safe and that I see you again very soon. But until then, take care. Bye. All right, let the man bun jokes begin now. Come on, let me have it. Leave them in the comments. <laughs> oh, have you guys been watching the X-Men 97? Have I talked about that before in outtakes? I feel like I have. It is so good. And I didn't realize, I like I, I kind of stopped watching for a minute and they released the final three episodes and I just watched the second to last one while I was eating just before recording and I gotta say it's amazing that I'm even recording right now and that I didn't just keep going right into the last episode but it's pretty fantastic and it's bringing in a lot of the stuff from like my favorite comic series from the 90s oh I don't want to give any spoilers but some good stuff check it out oh that is such a pretty peachy rosy hue to the light when you see it in person it looks a lot more like a blush but for some reason the ye it like goes yellow the light is too bright and uh, the camera can't handle it 
So you get kind of that sunburst, which looks kind of cool too, but I'm a little sad that you miss out on the on the pretty on the pretty blush color that I've got going there. Maybe I need to upgrade my camera. All right, let's see. Experiencing technical difficulties with the teleprompter. Come on, buddy. What's your deal? Remote not working. Hold, please. Sorry, just stop this. Okay, that's better. 27 point. And as for which sub, as for which sub, uh, uh, <clears throat> oh, you're focusing on the dragon again, aren't you? I can tell. Stop it. Stop. Oh, uh, 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 there you go. But I want to sit here. Can't I sit here and you just not focus on the dragon? Mm, apparently not. All right, fine. I'm scooting up. Get a little closer. Don't be shy. Get a little closer with air it extra dry. Isn't it crazy how commercial jingles just stick with us forever? And ever and ever. All right. Oh, okay. Don't move. <laughs> At level three, we would be a paladin two, and that means we get a fighting stool. <laughs> a fighting stool? Is that like a. <laughs> Sounds like the worst weapon ever. Um, okay. That's the stool that you're sitting on when a bar fight breaks out. <laughs> you know what I just realized? Oh, no, I couldn't. Never mind. Doot, doot, doot. <laughs> If they are prone, and that is, it is a, in, now that we're quickening, now that we're quickening, I got a squeaky eyeball. Sometimes when I rub it, it goes, can you hear that? <laughs> is that gross? Sorry. 